The advice and opinions expressed by Dr. Grant Pichet and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. Dr. Doreen Grand Pichet is the Dr. Doreen is an expert in autism. Doreen Grand Pichet. Dr. Grand Pichet. Dr. Doreen Grand Pichet. Dr. Doreen Grand Pichet is a visionary in the field of autism. Now you can ask her questions on Ask Dr. Doreen. Good morning and welcome to Ask Dr. Doreen. I am Shannon Penrod and look who I'm here with, the fabulous good Dr. Good morning. Doreen good morning, Shannon. Good morning. How good morning, are you? everyone. I'm good. Thanks. How Did are you? Did you have a good birthday? I had a great birthday. Oh, it was God. so nice. So ce celebratory. Wonderful. Just lots of fun. Thanks to our dear Chris who made a video of all the different offices and everything. It was lovely. Yeah. It was Everybody lovely. Everybody sent in, uh, uh, you know, all across the country, people um, set from the different card offices sent in very funny. We all were charged with being creative. It was amazing. Wishing you a happy birthday. Uh, it strained muscles for some people, <laughs> but it was a really good time, and we enjoyed watching all of them. So thrilled that you guys are here. I have to give one programming note that we apologize. We were supposed to be here with Lillian Carrier yesterday, and I was not feeling well. And so I'm so happy that I'm able to be here today. But we are going to reschedule with Lillian. I also wanted to make sure you guys know this week is it's the Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge. Mm. That uh, a week and a half ago, they had five days to film and uh, create these wonderful films around a theme. And they're out right now. And we have several people that are going to be on the show promoting their particular film. Mm -hmm. The prize this year is $15,000. Wow. So that's, a, that's some serious money we're talking about. And, yes. and I know I felt so bad because we weren't here. We weren't able to be here with Lillian. So if you go to our Facebook, there is a link to Lillian's uh, video. And every time you watch a video, it's you voting for the video. So it's a very serious thing. So please uh, look that up on our Facebook channel and take the opportunity to see that. We'll be talking about more of those films later on this week. But we're here with Dr. Dorian Grampy. No, it's so great we have to be here. Shannon, I also didn't ask you about the um, entertainment The autism conference. Minute. Well, you know, the interesting thing about that was that it was in the middle of the week when they were having to make yes. the film. So it was a lot of people that were there that were like, I'm here, but I'm editing in my head. <laughs> Do you yes. know what I mean? Um, it was really a lovely conference, and congratulations to, to Judy for making uh, a really wonderful event. And I think, you know, it was the first one, so it's yeah. just yeah. it's just the ground of what they're going to be able to do. We were in the, the ballroom, um, Chris and I, and um, so we got to see a lot of people. Nice. We want to thank uh, Wild Republic because we had a lot of stuffed animals that we gave away, and people people were like, where is everybody getting these crazy, wonderful stuffed animals? Nice. Um, and we talked to a lot of people. It was really, really fun. And I forget that I just don't go out at all anymore. Like I'm here, and so I, and I interview people, and I feel like I've seen them. But people are like, "You're here." Yeah. I don't know when I've seen You're you last. You're in person. You're in per I don't know when I've seen you last. So it was that was uh, it was good. It was uh, I have to admit that I'm like still struggling a little bit to be around large groups of people, and it was a lot of people. Yeah, it was she a lot had over 500 people, I think. Yeah. Um, and so I, there were a couple of times that I was like, breathe, breathe. We're with really? people. They're real. It's okay. Wow. <laughs> you know? Um, but it was a really, really lovely event. And I think that a, a lot happened at it. That Great. Um, Great. We, we saw some of the speeches. Um, and then during the lunch time, um, I will say that the, the lady who's do actually doing the research mm -hmm. uh, was yes. there. I, I read a brief statement because you sponsored the research. Yes. And I read a brief statement and I met her and she did a, a, a brief statement. Uh, and she's all excited about the research. And I said to her, I said, you know, when you have it, I, I, she said, would she like to see it? And I said, e yeah, she'll geek out on that. She'll like that a lot. Yeah. So she would love to oh, connect for with sure. you when, Definitely. That's when awesome. that's done. But it was a lovely, Great. Great. lovely event. Um, and well, it's really then. one of the only events that I'm going to this month. There have been so many events. I know I you've been imagine. here, there, and everywhere, but, um, but it was lovely. So anyway, if you're joining us right now, we're live. Um, and the date today is Tuesday, April 16th. The year is 2024. <laughs> For those of you that are archiving, right? Uh, we're live right now on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. You can be writing in your questions. Our topic today, our starting top is, topic is food selectivity. 
Uh, and we'll, we'll have Dr. Grampy Shea explain what that actually is, but I want to remind you right now, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and about a dozen other sites that are fabulous, Chris Desmond will show you in the next couple of minutes. Don't forget though, uh, we, this show will be archived on our YouTube channel where we have thousands of videos. Um, and you can search topics there and find answers over the last 14 years. It's mm -hmm. really crazy to think about. Um, but also, the show will then podcast to every major podcast platform where you can get a podcast for free. It will come with ads, because we understand that's how podcasts work. If you would like the ad-free version, you can do that by going to glow.fm slash autism live. Now, I want to be clear that there is the Autism Network, Autism Live, and Ask Dr. Doreen. And Autism Live and Ask Dr. Doreen are its own podcasts now. So if you want to get the Ask Dr. Doreen podcast, you need to subscribe to it so that you can get it automatically. The only place where that is not true is if you go to glow.fm slash autism live, where if you pay a small fee, you get it ad free and you get everything that the Autism Network does. So we hope that you will check that out and do what is best for you so that you can be being a part of this. You know at the Autism Network we're always trying to provide information and inspiration. That's what we're here about. Um, so good morning to Susie who's already here with us. Let's start Dr. Grampy Shea with what is food selectivity because that's kind of jargon in and of itself. Oh interesting. So you know it is what it says. Um, there are a lot of individuals who um, on and off the spectrum who uh, are very selective about what they eat. Now, I guess the, bi bi the bigger question is what causes it? Mm -hmm. And I think it's a number of different things. We're not, there's no real, uh, I guess, research saying these are the things that cause food selectivity. But, you know, if you look back at the symptoms of autism um, and, and also things that correlate to autism that are not necessarily part of the symptoms, it, comes, it becomes reasonable to say there are a number of different things that will lead to food selectivity. And what I mean by that is that, for example, we know that one of the symptoms of autism is sensory uh, you know, issues, sensitivities, right? And so part of that could very well be the child has a sensory negative reaction or the individual has a sensory negative reaction to the food, whatever that item might be. And that we've, I've definitely seen ma many children who will only eat things that are crunchy, will only eat things that are mushy. Yeah. Um, the, the texture of the food has a lot to do with it, mm -hmm. right? So that's one thing for some children. Mm -hmm. Another thing is obviously children will tend to go for things like that have sugar in them or let's say dyes in them because they're having a reaction to this and we tend to crave things that we are somewhat allergic to. So that's another aspect of it is just, you know, are we craving the things that are, I guess, everyone does, right? right? Things that we react to and so on. But I think a bigger part of what happens with food selectivity, Shannon, and I, I don't know, this is my theory. Yeah. Is well, that, you are an expert, so <laughs> I want to hear your yeah, theory. <laughs> is that I think that at some point a food that the individual eats causes either a positive or a negative um, feeling. Mm -hmm. And those could be, for instance, uh, you could ha eat something and it'll cause you very significant gastrointestinal issues, right? Yeah. Diarrhea, constipation, bloating, pain, etc. And what you'll do then is not only avoid that food because you now have a very bad kind of conditioning to that, yeah. but you'll, as a child, you know, as adults, let's say we go to a restaurant and you'll have, let's say, you go to a Mexican restaurant and you'll eat something like that has beans and you will go home and you'll be like, oh, I feel terrible, right? And what you'll do is you will avoid beans and perhaps other legumes, like things right. that are in the same classification as beans because they make you feel bad. But as a child, you don't know those nutritional classifications. So what you'll end up doing is you'll generalize to things of the same color or things of the yeah. same texture or things of the same 
I don't know, whatever size, you know. Or restaurants on that street. Or restaurants on that street, there you go. So, you know, you might go somewhere, eat something, and it'll make you feel bad, and then from there on, you never want to go back to that location, that street, that kind of food, that color of food. So over time, you become more and more selective because of that bad experience you had. And let's not forget that there's a pretty high correlation of gastrointestinal issues with autism, right? So let's not forget that more foods are causing issues for individuals who are autistic yeah. than anyone else. So that is a, that's a big part of it, I think, is how they experience. Now there's also the other side of it, which is that we tend to eat foods that, or some of our individuals will eat foods that are causing them to feel a little bit kind of high, loopy, and that's kind of the yeast effect that yeah. we talk about, right? So a lot of kids will have, a, and candida, they might have reactions to uh, foods that are causing gr overgrowth of yeast, and as a result, so, you know, what they'll do is they'll actually eat more of those foods because yeah. they're trying to maintain that kind of, you know, loopy feeling. Yeah. And so there's a lot that goes into why we develop food selectivity. And it, it re that's one of the reasons that I love that you have Julie Matthews on the show. And yeah. it's a big issue. It's a very important issue. Not only is it important in the sense that once we get rid of the things that are either allergens or causing pain or discomfort or bloating or inflammation, what we're doing is reducing that inflammation in the gut, which will then help improve lots of other things, right? The, the immune system is no longer suppressed. You will now have a lot more energy. You'll, your digestion is better, so you're getting better nutrition. I mean, it's an array of benefits from that and and it certainly will also affect the child's behavior in a lot of ways there we go uh so giving a shout out to taryn who has been a regular watcher for years and taryn put a friend's name in the chat and said to the friend listen to her she's helped, helped me so much that's awesome which Karen. you know what a great I, I will tell you if you have a friend that you want to watch the show putting their name in the chat yes uh, it means that they automatically get the link and they can go watch back and watch so i like how you're thinking taryn uh and and she's helped a lot of us so i love that susie says uh this is a very important topic for us my son is a picky eater how can we improve sensory sensitivity right susie so that's a great question and th thank you for taking us to the next step of this whole thing yeah so first you kind of want to try to like everything else right you want to try to find the function the reason like what is going on with your particular child right so a child might be craving things they're allergic to a child might all those things that I said in your case you feel that your child is very sensory and that's what's causing him to be picky make sure it's not the other stuff right and if you then are kind of uh, just focus on the sensory that's actually easier than a lot of other things and there are lots of feeding programs uh, uh, some behavior analysts are actually trained in doing feeding programs and I'll tell you how it works um, and you might want to find a BCBA who is a kind of trained in, in feeding that's what it's called in the ABA world but what it is is essentially a shaping procedure. You know how with other things we are always shaping a behavior. So you kind of segment the behavior into a million little tiny parts and you reward each successive approximation to where you want to get, right? So with feeding, uh, you actually will start with the, the tiniest, tiniest morsel of something that is, let's say, sensory disturbing to the child, mm -hmm. and then you'll have a whole pile of what the child likes, right? So that is not sensory uh, disturbing, but is also pleasant, something rewarding food that is what he normally eats. And so for that tiny, like let's say quarter of a teaspoon, he will now get all this other stuff. And over the course of time, you reverse that schedule. So that quarter becomes a half a teaspoon, you get your dessert, let's say, and then you do a three quarters of a teaspoon and you get what you want and a, a full teaspoon and so on to the point where we now have a um, pretty, you know, broad diet and we're eating all the things that we used to not like. This takes time. It's a gradual process. And whenever the child is, and you know, let's, it's not 
as easy as I just said, right? Obviously, the child, you get to a point where, uh, you know, let's say half a teaspoon is now too much. And the child's like, no, I don't want this other reward for it. And that's okay. You continue to persist. And you don't give the good stuff until the child masters the next level and the next level, or at least the level they're in, right? Because you want to make sure you don't go backwards. And so this process of rewarding every successive approximation um, is kind of a really easy way to do it, but it takes a long yeah. time. And um, there's a lot of other things that go into it, you know, with feeding, like you really want to celebrate so there are things like if you can't motivate the child with the yummy food they're about to get you can certainly motivate them with you know turning the tv on every time yeah. they take a little bite um or putting on their favorite song or giving them their ipad or whatever it is a heavy reinforcer yeah. is what you use at that time to reward the current or the next uh, approximation yeah i also want to remind us all that what we do have to stop is the lecturing. Yes, that, yes, that yes, yes. You have to stop <laughs> the battle at the work. table and sitting there going, you know, like yeah. if you present it and go, if you eat this, you get this, and then we need to yep. stop talking. That's right, yeah. Because I think that's where the stress level goes up for us and that the kids ratchet up too, is that we go, come on, I just need you to eat this bite. Why won't you eat? And that becomes the womp, 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 womp from yeah. the peanuts thing. So right. we have to, right. we just have to, it's, it is no, what it is and yeah. there's no debate, there's no argument, there's yep. no yep. fight about it. And, and I think it's important for people to realize or recognize why that is so important to what you're saying, Shannon. And you know, like, even in, uh, when you're parenting a non-autistic individual, uh, 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 any other child, right? That kind of lecture portion mm. of you should be doing this or you should be doing yeah. that doesn't always work. Sometimes it works. It works when the child is so highly, highly motivated to please you. That's, yeah. That is a form of reinforcement for sure is like some children are extremely connected to their parents' praise, right? And that's great. Um, and for those children, it might be possible to just tell them what is right or wrong, and then they will try to please you, and they will try to do that thing. But for a lot of children, it is more a, it's not, you know, they're not willing to go that far and take something that they really feel like it's gonna make them gag. And, and, and I want to say, the, one side of it is the lecture, the other side of it is forcing. Like, you wow. never want to force a child to eat something because truthfully, that actually can become also aversive and it's just not something you want to do. It's not a good plan. The child will not only react to that, but they will react to you. It's just yeah. not a good thing. It's, it's punitive and you never want to really take that approach. There we go. Uh, I didn't really say before, but uh, you know, if you guys don't know, Dr. Gra I think the people here watching know, but Dr. Grampuche is a true expert in the field of autism. Been no. working in this field mm -hmm. for more than 45 years, um, and you happen to be an expert in food selectivity as well uh, as part of that. Uh, I mean, I don't know if I'm an expert, but I've done feeding. Yeah, I th you've done it for 45 years. Yeah, I think yeah, that I've qualifies you for an expert. Um, but I do want everybody to know the disclaimer that uh, you know she doesn't have eyes on your particular right, right. circumstance. So uh, we gave the the thing at the beginning of the show. Yes, disclaimer. consult with somebody that's close to you. This is meant to be. Um, you know, things for you to take into consideration, not medical advice. Okay, uh, Lucy says, good morning. Do you recommend fermented foods, since there are many probiotics in these foods, it may be a challenge to have my child accept these foods at first, but I have heard many great benefits of eating fermented foods. She went on to say, we have had feeding therapy at our ABA center and we have seen major progress. It takes time, but it's been working well for us. We're now over a year, but it has been so much better now since when we started. Yeah, it's the, those incremental, there'll be a day and a time sometime in the future where you'll be like, oh, that was 10 years ago and we don't have to do yeah. that anymore, right? Yeah, it's true. Because time marches on, you might as well it be does, moving sure. in the right direction. For sure. So. And in regards to the fermented foods, yeah. you know, I, you can go that path and certainly fermented foods are good for us, but you could also go the path of 
um, really, really good probiotics. Um, and I have to say that, you know, I'm one of those people that believes that if the um, gut um, balance of good and bad uh, uh, bacteria uh, becomes kind of uh, dislodged, if the balance is overturned, if we end up losing a lot of our good bacteria, for one reason or another it happens, uh, it's really, really hard to get that balance back. Um, it is, a, a friend of mine who was a chemist said to me, it's like trying to populate a beach with handfuls of sand, mm. right? So it takes a really long time and very, very strong probiotics, prebiotic foods, et cetera. Um, I have always found that for myself, and for a lot of kids, I actually learned this from one of the physicians who is in the field, um, VSL-3 is a fantastic probiotic. It is stronger, much, 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 much stronger than anything that's on the market. Yeah. It's 450 billion cells in one little packet, right? And not to advertise it, but it's super strong. And uh, it doesn't always, it's not always good to give a child something that is super strong. You always want to work your way through up to it because it also, a high level of probiotics can cause diarrhea. Yeah. So it's just something that I advise you to try to, if your child is having issues with their gut, you really should be talking to a variety of people, a nutritionist or a dietitian, as well as I often really recommend kind of, uh, you know, naturopathic, homeopathic, functional medicine physicians, but also it's important, I think, to talk to Western medicine physicians because you want to be able to make sure there's nothing else wrong, right. you know? And you want to kind of look at both sides of it and make sure that you are actually treating everything you need to. Yeah, we were just talking to a mom the other night about, uh, with a 15-year-old, that, um, that the technology is pretty good now, those pills that they swallow and they can track the whole way oh, down. Oh, cam. And, um, and that we've seen some kids do that. And I think it's devastating for the yeah. parents to realize after years of, you know, waiting and worrying and trying this diet yeah. and trying that diet, and then they see the ulceration in the intestines yeah. and yeah. realize, oh, we got to get, it's not, you know, this is much more serious than we thought. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, know. So, you know, I don't know if you remember, but when w this would have been like around 2000, I want to say 15 or so, mm -hmm. so long, long time ago, like over almost 10 years ago, we actually, I published on the use of the pill cam because mm -hmm. what we did was we had a young, um, wonderful BCBA, Helen Yu, I don't know if you remember yeah. her, but she was in our Texas office and we worked um, with a physician there, Arthur Kriegsman, mm -hmm. and he was doing a lot of uh, endoscopies because you're, mm -hmm. they're looking at the uh, you know, small intestine and they want to yeah. kind of, a colonoscopy is not going to look at that. So basically the idea was can we, it, what can we do not to have every child go through an endoscopy, right? Yeah. And so we used our pill swallowing protocol to teach children how to swallow the pill cam, because mm. the pill cam's big. Yeah. It is big. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's They like, haven't gotten it smaller over the years? No, or? no, they're big. They're like the size of, uh, not to compare it to a cockroach, but that's the size they are. They're pretty big. <laughs> like, they're like one and a half inches. Like, they're wow. big. And so to get a child to swallow that takes a little time. Yeah. But once they swallow it, it's insane, Shannon. Yeah. Like it's unbelievable that wow. this thing is going down taking pictures and then they discard it, of course, and it melts. But like getting all those pictures, and, and that's exactly what I was talking about. It's like, well, you know, with me, I mean, I'm sharing all personal stuff, but for <laughs> years I thought I had SIBO, right? right? For years I thought that I have small intestinal bacterial infection, small right. intestinal SIBO, SIBO. And I was taking the antibiotic for it and diets and all this sort of stuff until I had a routine endoscopy and they found that I have an ulcer. Right. So it is very important to make sure that you do kind of both sides and yeah. figure out what's going on. 
Absolutely. Uh, Andrea has written in and said, good morning, ladies. We are doing nutritional therapy along with all other therapies, ABA, OT, and speech. In nutritional therapy, they say to start where the kiddo is at and only change things in 10% increments. Yes. Uh, by doing this, my son is now eating over 50, 50 different types of plants a week. Isn't amazing. that amazing? That's Love exactly that. right, Andrea. It's always, it's the same in ABA. You basically always want to start with baseline. And baseline is where your child is, and then you will gradually <clears throat> change it from there. So absolutely. Wonderful. And I also want to say that Rodney has says, hi, Dr. Doreen. Good Love morning. That. Good morning. Uh, okay. So we have a question that came in earlier this week. How do I get my child to eat healthy food? He eats three things, Burger King French fries, Chick-fil-A nuggets, and McDonald's hamburgers. I have to go to three drive throughs to feed him. I feel like a failure. Aww. and he drinks tons of milk. How do I get oh. him to eat something else he refuses? Oh. Yeah, let's all take a breath. Yeah, but I, there's a, there's, I have good news and bad news. I'm gonna give you the bad first because the bad is where the hard work is. But I wanna tell you, you're gonna have a really beautiful result. So here's yeah. where you start. Let's put the food issue away for a minute. You have to get him off milk. Yeah. And I have children, I have so many children where this has happened, where it's, it's interesting, you know, I would never typically tell a child, get, get your tell a parent, get your child off milk. Because that's, every parent's first question is, how does he get his calcium? I mean, the, the reason we give our uh, kids milk is calcium, right? So the first thing is get a calcium supplement. And they ha if you go to any kind of f uh, pharmacy or, or just uh, CVS, you know, whatever, Rite Aid, and you say, I want liquid calcium, they will order it for you. And it comes in a little bottle like this. I gave that to my kids and sh when they were growing up. And Shannon, you know, my kids have the craziest hair on nails, yes, like in the do. universe. Yeah. So it's all about calcium. And you just want to make sure. And it's delicious, by the way. It's, a, really? it's so good. It tastes like um, just sugar water. But it isn't. It's just calcium in a, in a in, um what is that other syrup that's actually pretty healthy? So the whole thing is fantastic. You just give them a spoon of that. You don't have to worry about milk anymore or calcium, right? Now you want to change your child because your child is going to want milk. So how are you going to replace that? Thank God today we have 10 different kinds of milk. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't years ago. Yeah. But now you need to get your child onto some other milk. And if it's a boy, you want to try probably not soy milk. Um, you want to try rice. Rice might cause constipation, so you don't want to try it if it's a child who's tending towards that. There's almond milk. There's oat milk. There's. You just want to make sure it's not something that your child is is allergic to, reactive right. to. And there's got you know these days it's so easy. There's so many food sensitivity tests that are done based on either finger prick or just spit. You know, yeah. so that's amazing. Just, so get a type of milk that your child is okay with. And now you, you first have to replace the milk. So what you're doing is you're going to have, you know, a little bit of the regular milk or a lot of the regular milk, whatever he's eat, drinking, and then mix in a little bit of the new milk. And then gradually, again, shape it so that your child doesn't recognize as the taste is changing, right? And you could also add flavorings that are okay for your child, like stevia, stevia or... Um, or vanilla or something that's okay for your child to make it better. But your goal, your first goal is to get rid of the milk. I cannot tell you the difference people report when they get their child off just cow's milk. That is probably one of the most important changes and that's the good news because once you've done that, very likely your child's appetite will open up and not and they will not be as selective with those particular foods. Now, you also now have to go back and work on that whole thing because a lot of what you mentioned is high in gluten, right? Like we have chicken, I think it was chicken, Chick-fil-A, which is, I, I assume it's the nuggets, which are covered yeah, in nuggets. bread. And then it was the McDonald's burger, which is and the covered in bread. French fries. And the fries. So you're looking at a lot of gluten. So. The, you have a child who, and this is the, the lucky part, I guess, is that when you identify a child who has either a gluten or casein intolerance and you change their diet, it, the change you see is drastic. 
So I would really recommend that you talk to a nutritionist who's going to help you get your child on a less gluten, casein-free as much as possible diet, and it will change things. And again, it's <clears throat> the chain is the same process I was talking about earlier. It is a shaping procedure. So you might, uh, you know, produce your own chicken nuggets which you can make with healthy things at home, for instance, almond flour instead of bread ink or any, there's so much, there are so many choices now yeah. that you can use. Um, and then what you'll do is you'll ask, you'll request your child to have one tiny piece of the chicken nugget you made, and then they can have the rest of the chicken nugget from Chick-fil-A. And then you do that reversal that I was talking about that where you gradually increase yours and gradually reduce the external one. You do want to try to get your child off of these kind of um, fast food type things. Um, and believe me when I tell you, I know it's kind of scary. And as parents, listen, I'm an Iranian mom, so I know how it feels when our kids don't want to eat, right? Mm -hmm. We're like, oh my God, the world is ending. Yeah. But it's not, and they will, your child will adjust and they won't, no, they're not going to starve. Like, let's be sure of that. And but working with a nutritionist is where it's at because they will guide you every day, and that's important because it's kind of like when we diet ourselves, we give up. You know, we get to a point and we give up. We get to a point and we give up, and it's kind of like when you're doing this with your child, it's so difficult that you want someone telling you, you did it right, keep going, it'll change. And when you see those changes, it's insane. Like, and I'll just go back and say, you know, my son had a, re had, when he was very young, he had gotten to that phase of, I noticed he wasn't eating, he just wasn't eating. And he had, all he wanted to drink was milk all the time. And he also had these like really dark rings. And I was like, what is going on with him? And I had taken him to lots of doctors and they were like, oh, maybe he had something with his sinuses, like even to the point where we had um, sinus x-rays and all kinds of stuff, right? But it ended up, I don't remember what, this is many years ago, he's now 25, right? So this is a long, long time ago. But what I ended up doing was actually getting rid of milk in his diet. And I was like, he's going to have to try something else. He's not going to have milk. And in those days, we didn't have all these choices. I think the only other thing we had was soy, actually. Yeah. And I gave him some soy. And he was so happy. I don't know if, you, if I ever told you this, mm. Shan. This was when he was so young that he only could, because it was draw, writing phonetically. It was like right. maybe three years, I think, right? right? And so he would make all these posters that were like, <laughs> the new milk, <laughs> it's, I love it, you should try it. Like oh, he was all over the place. So, it. But it changed him completely. Yeah. The dark rings went, he started eating. I mean, it just changed him altogether. Yeah, well, I'm somebody who's allergic to milk and yeah, I, I've too. cycled in and out of my allergy to milk. As a baby, I was yeah. allergic to milk and, they, and so I didn't have milk. And then I think when I was four or five, my mother started giving me milk and that was fine. But then when I got to college, I was having all of these problems yeah, yeah. and finally went to uh, an allergist who said, well, you're allergic to milk. And I thought, because I love milk. Yeah. I love cheese. Yeah. I love yogurt. Yeah. Uh, and most of my adult life, I've been either vegan or vegetarian. So you take away my milk and I'm like lost. But I remember so as true. a sophomore in college going off of milk and going, what just happened? Yeah. That my whole body was yeah. different. Then, you know, later on as an adult, I did a test and I was like, oh, I'm, I'm not showing myself sensitive. So then, of course, I promptly binged for the next 10 years on it. And now I'm horribly allergic. I eat a little bit yeah. of milk and I'm hives. I'm yeah. hive city. Wow. So, um, and that's a bummer. That's amazing. That's a bummer. But there's all kinds of other stuff now. There's so now. many options now. It's like, I, I don't remember the last time I had milk, honestly, because yeah. I'm just an almond milk drinker and that's that. Yeah. I mean, you can go anywhere now and order five different kinds of milk. Oh, I know. It's crazy. So, yeah. But I will say, for those of you who are like, yeah, but I look and there's all these ingredients in the nut milks, I will tell you that you can get a machine now. Oh, yeah. That, yeah. It, you know, they're a little bit pricey, and we've said to one that they should sponsor us, and they haven't, so I'm not going to say the name. Uh, you want me to say the name, you got a sponsor. 
I'm getting I'm getting down and dirty with things now. Good, yeah. But they have these machines that you put like a little bit of nuts in, and they say if you want it a little bit sweeter, one date. You don't want chemicals and no sugar. One date. You don't have to do it with a date. Mm -hmm. You pour in the water. You push the button, and two minutes later, you have completely chemical-free yeah. nut milk. Um, it's good stuff. Yeah. It's really good stuff. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, I have this question that I promised Marina that I would get to. Oh, sure. Uh, hi, thank you for all your support. Uh, you both have provided me via YouTube forever. Grateful always in my, you're in my prayers. I have a question. My son, six years old, he has good manding, but he's not asking questions yet. Mm -hmm. Do you have any tips to teach manding for info? I've got skills, but I need help. I want him to expand his language. He can speak more, but he doesn't have the motivation to do so. And when it becomes comes to factual things, he doesn't understand and cannot answer on it. For an example, best friend, favorite color, mm -hmm. uh, what's dad's car? Yeah. Okay. So... Language development is, goes in a particular order. Manding is the very, very first thing that we do, um, even as infants, which is requesting things where the object in itself or the thing that we're asking for in itself is rewarding. So when you're a baby, you will mand for mommy, you will mand for food, milk, uh, whatever, you know, bottle. Um, and what you're doing is, and as you, and that's the very first form of communication. Like that is where you, um, in typical development, you are realizing that there's a way to get the things that you want, and usually from others, right? From another person. This person is a means of getting for me what I want. And that's manding. The next level that occurs is tacting, which is just labeling things. And now what's interesting about tacting is that you generally tact to your parents when you're first developing, right? So you're labeling things to your parents and there's still a reinforcer in it and the reinforcer is your parents going, that's right, good job, wow, you know? And that is like the initial building of language. And it's really interesting in studies where like children have been abused or you know, in a very severely neglected, that phase of tacting is, is either completely delayed or just doesn't occur because yeah. there is no one to encourage the child to continue to label things. And this is like, I always say, imagine the, let's say, two-year-old sitting in the back of the car just going, you know, fire truck and red wall, whatever it is, right? And so that stuff, uh, it, it happens next. Then the next phase that happens is intraverbals. And I think the last example that the parent was talking about is like talking about something is an intraverbal, right? Yeah. And that doesn't happen. It's got a, there's a lot of complicated uh, basis for how an intraverbal can occur. And an intraverbal, first of all, you have to have an understanding of lots of different developmental stages. I don't want to go into a lecture, mm -hmm. but it's like, you know, I can still talk about the things that are not present because they are in my mind and I can describe them. I can also talk about things that you, that who I'm talking to, know about because you have knowledge from other sources and that's the theory of mind stuff that comes in. So there's a lot of, uh, I guess, background information that a child has developed by the time they start to use intraverbals. With your child, the fact that they're manning, that's a wonderful thing, that's great. You need to be talking, and if you're using the language of saying my child mans, then you're definitely working with a BCBA, right? Because that's ABA lingo. So please go back to your BCBA and say, hey, we need to move on from manning. Um, you can, a child can be taught to mand for, um, you know, food items, toys, objects, they want activities. I don't know if your child is manning for activities, things that they want to do. That would probably be a step. They can mand for people, like people that they want to hang out with. But generally speaking, manning has to do with requesting something that is in and of itself reinforcing. Mm -hmm. If you've done all the different types of mands, you need to move on now to tacting, which is labeling things and then everyone rewarding the child being able to label. Labeling things has its own set of 
um, advancements. So you will label something initially on its own, then you can label it as with descriptors, which would be adjectives and, you know, the red truck. And then you put that together with things like other descriptors in the environment, like the red truck that's on the table. Those types, so it's just, it is a, a very expansive. You can go for very far with just acting. Um, but introverbals are then talking about things that are not necessarily present visually, and that is another phase. So I feel like you can't skip these phases. You sort of have to develop. I do want to say that um, if you want guidance or help with this, we built a, a system many years ago called Skills. She has skills. She okay. said in there that she has okay, skills. Okay, great. So if you're on skills, then just follow the lessons. Don't worry about manning, tacting, intervals, and all that sort of stuff. If you've done the assessments, the assessments should have given you a series of lessons. And go. you're in language curriculum. Go in language curriculum and just keep moving up to the next level. Yeah. Don't try to jump ahead. You, you have a lot of lessons in between. Yeah. And there's a little trick that with skills that the, the lessons are numbered. Like you, you were given a recommendation and you, so you have a bank of things that these are great lessons for your kiddos. Yes. And I think, I think what parents do is they read through them and go, that's the one I want to do. Yes, yes. Um, but they are numbered and, and... Not only are they numbered, they are listed in order of like this, everything has a prerequisite. Yes. And you need to do the prerequisites. And, and when you've mastered something, it kind of tells you where to go next. There so you, go. you do have to follow the order of things. That is very, very important. There we go. Uh, I got a couple of food questions I want to get to. My daughter will not eat anything mushy. No applesauce, no mashed potatoes. Should I be concerned? She's 12. At what point do I give up and say that's just her preference? You know, that's a great question, and I appreciate that you uh, brought that to us. I don't think you need to be concerned unless there's a nutritional deficiency or it interferes with her, uh, you know, ability to live happily. So I think that's always the question. It's like um, if you are, if it often occurs that you go someplace and she doesn't have choices on the menu, then maybe it's worth intervening. Yeah. Right, so that she has a broad array of choices in, in life. Yeah. Um, and also if she is nutritionally having some issues. So for example, if, if she's heading towards obesity or if she has a, a deficiency, if she's underweight uh, or any kind of deficiency that requires eating something that is mushy. Um, those types of things you should discuss with a nutritionist. Other than that, if she's doing fine, she always, ha it's kind of like when you're, uh, vegan, that's a great example, mm -hmm. right? It's a choice that you make to be vegan, and you're not always going to have a lot of, like, I go out with my daughter who is vegetarian and mm -hmm. gluten-free, right? Right, And that's hard. Uh, she hard. has celiac. So when we go out, you have to find things that are gluten-free, but they can't also have meat in them or of any right. kind. So it's very limiting for her. Yeah. But you know what? It's fine. She manages, we manage, it's fine. Yeah. So it's not like I'm going to sit down and try to intervene heavily. In her case, you can, it's a choice that yeah. she makes. So um, yeah, it's fine. Uh, oh, here's one. My child eats dirt and paper oh, sometimes. Okay. Recently, somebody told me that is called pica and pica, that I need yeah. to get help right away. I looked it up and he's not eating batteries or anything sharp. Should I still be worried? And how do you treat that? Yes, pica is the uh, ingestion of non-edible items. So it's not that the item itself could cause danger. Obviously, that is one particular thing, right? So sometimes children will eat rocks or stones or pebbles or things that can actually cause a lot of problems. As you said, batteries or sharp objects, that sort of thing. But it's not that. I think you just, you definitely don't want your child eating non edible items for a variety of reasons. Our gastrointestinal system is not built to digest or eliminate non edible items, right? So you need to intervene. Um, and there's two things that are important. One is, for safety reasons, you need to intervene. And again, with pica, it's pretty much the same thing. It's a, 
uh, blocking of the non-edible item, uh, the blocking of the ingestion of a non-edible item, followed by a you know a high reinforcer of eating edible items. But more importantly than that, you need to figure out if your child has a nutritional deficiency that they're trying to fix. And that is funny because I've had a lot of children, not a lot, but I've had many children who have, would eat something and then we'd go and do a blood test and find out, oh, they have a calcium deficiency and they're trying to eat the caulk on the wall because there's calcium in it, you know, yeah. or things like that. And so I think it's very, very important to start out with just a blood test to see if your child has any deficiency. You would be surprised. Uh, also, you, what you'll find out from a blood test is if by eating these non-edible items, your child is now getting high levels of something toxic. So that's super important as well. And I have had children where like their aluminum level was so high that it was insane. And we had to seek out and find out what is it they're eating that's causing that. So yeah, it, it is something you should intervene with. We never want to ignore our children eating something non-edible. There we go. Kylie has written and said, good morning. Is it possible to have a demonstration of skills one time on the show? And, oh, and we've great. been talking, uh, Laurie, um, Okay, I'm having a senior moment. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's not Lisa, Lisa Bancroft. Bancroft. I said I said Lori, and I meant Lisa Bancroft. Uh, she and I are going to do. I I think rather than do it on the show, she and I are going to do two different webinars. One for card families, how to use skills, because it's slightly different. You're using yes. it with a BCBA who's supervising you. And one for people who are using skills outside of card, that you're going it alone, or you have your BCBA, but your Perfect. BCBA isn't plugged in. But we're thinking of doing that as webinars, not on the show, so that you can interact a little easier, and that you can ask questions directly, and we can answer. And we're, we're looking at May, end of May for that. And, and videotape that, please. Oh yeah, we will. Uh, we will. Yeah. But, so that's what we're thinking of doing, and it's taking me much longer than I had anticipated, Kylie, but that, that's in the works right now. Lisa and I are talking it through. I don't know why I said Lori. I think because Lori's here and we're saying good morning to all, all of our, our friends are showing up uh, towards the end of the hour. Lori's here. Paula is here. Paula, I am coming to Scotland. I know that's not real close, but I'm coming to Scotland. Uh, <laughs> so in August, I'm going to be in Scotland awesome, for 10 awesome. days. Ooh. It's going to be like crazy. Uh, I do want to get to this question. Um, Sarah has written and said, with AI developing at such a fast rate, yeah. what skills would you now have less focus on and maybe more focus on given AI might support language? Is the ABA field looking into adopting AI? Uh. Someone has written in and said, no, it can't be reliant on AI, but I think reliant is the word. We just had a guest on the show the other day with AI software for ABA. Uh, and But I know this is a subject very near and dear to your yeah, heart. I'm really into AI, yeah. Um, Sarah, it's a great question. And also I want to say, Daniel, yeah, I understand where you're coming from as well. I don't, so yes. I mean, first of all, there's lots of different applications of AI. Um, one of the first, ap so AI is very interesting because it is a computerized process that looks at past information and tries to generate what uh, you know a, a, a behavior or response or something would be based on that past information. So for example, a, a lot of us use ChatGPT and it is based on thousands and thousands and thousands of entries uh, that it has digested. And so now you can go to ChatGPT and say, hey, you know, write me a resume and it knows how to write a resume and it requests information from you and it'll get it going for you. Okay, so it, but Emphasis so on get it going. Get it going. Somebody still uh, you, has to check it. You will go back and check it and fix it, yes, but it does go, uh, help with a lot of progress. Now, how does that apply to, and let me tell you, we're also looking at AI for efficiencies within the operational portion of CARD, for instance, and other, other businesses, because it does help 
reduce manual labor. Let's put it that way. Like, you know, every time we want to get a therapist or a, or a BCBA authorized to provide services with a particular insurance company, somebody has to put in a ton of information into a form. AI can do that. So that helps. Now, with regards to the clinical side of things, which is really interesting and important, many, many years ago, we started to do, use a, um, what's called machine learning. Machine learning is the basis uh, on which AI could be developed. Machine learning is a computer going in and looking at thousands of millions of data points and analyzing and looking to see if there are patterns in those data points so that an AI algorithm could jump on that and say, hey, based on this pattern, this is what we're going to do next. So we started doing machine learning with a lot of the data uh, that we collect on our thousands of kids over the years. Of course, it's all unidentified data, so it's just pure numbers and data, not who, who it belongs to. When you look at those, we were able to publish a study that said, hey, we're looking at 16 specific phenotypes, subtypes of autism. We published that. That was in 2016, I think, a long time ago. So it was more about, okay, this is interesting. Now, why did we do that? The reason we did that was because going forward for any child who enters an ABA program, we wanted to be able to take the uh, characteristics of that child and see which phenotype they belong to. Because if we are able to identify the child's specific subtype faster, it'll help us be able to help that child faster. I mean, as you all know, there's lots and lots of different types of autism. There are children who are visual learners. There are children who have food selectivity, great example. There are children who do very well with uh, you know, iPads as a reinforcer. There are children who are very hyperactive. So identifying their phenotype helps us look at that subset and look at the kids who did really, really well in that subset and figure out all the things we have to do for that subset as opposed to the whole spectrum of autism. So that's one way that AI is going to help. Now, also, I do want to say we uh, gamification or producing games is another AI mm -hmm. type of thing, right? Where you take a subject, and if you think about all educational games where there's nothing wrong with them, they're awesome. Yeah. So like you look at a game made by Sesame Street. My kids used to play these games, right, with Elmo, right? right. And it shows like, you know, uh, touch pink or, you know, whatever it is. And as the child did it, then they received a whole, ooh, yay, and all that. Many years ago, we produced a series of games called Camp Discovery. They are on the app library. Yeah. And Camp Discovery teaches our kids based on ABA uh, like systems. So it has kind of a discrete trial thing built under it, into it, so that the same process where you receive something, you're rewarded if you get it correct, if you're not, you're prompted. It's like the same algorithm that we use in therapy. And so we put in the first like few games, right? A few lessons, the earliest lessons, like colors, numbers, alphabet, those types of things. And we are actually, now that AI has advanced so much, we are looking at making more games for yeah. our kids. Now, Daniel, to answer your question, I agree with you, there's a limit to that. And we were doing this because over time, we want to be able to take advantage of every awake hour of the child. So if the child's sitting in the back of the car, we want them on Camp Discovery or whatever we end up naming the new gamification. But we want them learning. We want them learning from these things, right? But if it gets to a point where the child has mastered all this stuff, we do actually want them observing. Yeah. We do actually want the child to interact with people because there are subtleties that no chat bot or AI robot or anything has yet to be able to conquer and understand. So definitely facial expression, being able to read body language, being able to socialize and converse back and forth. These are things that are still not 
advanced in, in the world of AI, and I don't believe that we will ever fully depend on AI, but I think we can use AI to help supplement and increase the learning of our kids because it can make things more efficient. There we go. Ra saying good morning to Raina and Esther. Esther, I want to know how the new baby is. I've been having terrible baby cravings at this age. I just want, uh, like nobody around me has had a baby recently. I just, I've, I've threatened <laughs> to come to Esther's house. Uh, she's going to get a restraining order because uh, <laughs> she has a new baby. Uh, but Esther wants to know, what are your thoughts on medication for a five-year-old with autism and ADHD? Does it help? And thank you. Sorry, I was just reading Daniel's thing at the same time when you said that, where he was talking about sometimes kids will just grab something and stim on it, chewing on their shirt. And that's actually a good point because, like, that is, uh, that's not really pica because they're right. not swallowing it, but they are chewing. It can be sensory, this whole putting things in your mouth and, and yes. so on. It can be sensory. So now let's go back. Sorry. What that's was okay. The, yeah. So Esther wants to know, and I cabelled over Esther's baby, and she's invited me over, so that's happening. Um, but... Uh, what are your thoughts on medication for a five-year-old with autism and ADHD yeah. does it help? Yeah, so I, it depends on the medication and it depends on the symptoms of your child. I am very open-minded about the help that we can get from medication. I feel like some of our kids would not have made the progress they made with ABA had they not been on the right medication. I'm working with a child right now where I can tell you that when he's off medication, he is absolutely unable to pay attention to anything, even for a minute. We've worked with it for years trying to get him to pay uh, attention, and he is actually quite a smart child. And when he is on his medication, which is in his case, because he also struggled a lot with obsessive compulsive behaviors, I really wanted him, I've been working with Cleveland clinics for him, and I really wanted him to be on an SSRI type of medication, something that would help take the edge off his obsessions, right, and reduce his need to do these. He has uh, obsessive body movements that have to occur in a particular pattern. And um, so I wanted an SSRI, which helps that. But his attention was so uh, just impossible that the physician that I work with at Cleveland Clinic, who's brilliant, um, Dr. Aldo Seri is a neurologist at Cleveland Clinic, he felt that we could also help use medication to help with the ADHD portion of it. And so there is actually an SSRI medication that is also helps with, um, acts as a stimulant uh, or, or, you know, prevents ADHD or helps with attention, Stratera. So we put the child on Stratera and it has resulted in a significant impact. Now I will say the child also has the most incredible team of ABA therapists and he is receiving over 40 hours of ABA yeah. so a week. So I will say that that is also part of it. So I think the combination, and it's every child, it's a specific to that child what they need. So yeah. I think it's a combination of both. I also want to look at the diet and look at how pesticides Absolutely. in the child's diet. And sleep. And sleep. There we go. There's a whole bunch of things. Um, but, the, but lowering the pesticides has been shown to reduce the yeah, there uh, you go. ADHD behavior too. Uh, we're almost out of time, but Raina says, do you think, what do you think about broccoli sprouts for ASD? Does it help like people are claiming? I absolutely don't know anything about that, Raina. And I would, that's a question for Julie Matthews. She probably would have better information about that. Yeah, that's, that's the sulf yes. sulfara flora thing. Yeah. Yes. But you know what? Julie Matthews just had this amazing conference and I, because I was out, I wasn't talking about it here, but I think you can still get the recording from it. Everybody should go to nourishinghope.com yes. and check it out because she just did a two-day conference yeah. about all of this stuff. And I just want to say that, you know, there's a lot of different things that come up in time. And until there's a little bit of, I guess, research, yeah. even if it's just a few case studies, you have to be cautious about what you're doing. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, and I know that there's a uh, discussion about the chewing uh, with some suggestions. Thank you for that, Anna. Uh, Autism Journey with Elijah says that their uh, child is doing guamphacine. 
uh, has ADHD and autism, magic, mm -hmm. it works well So for their child. So it's different for everybody. Um, okay, so that's all the time that we have for today because I also have to run through what's happening on the show this week. Uh, tomorrow, we are having two actual guests on the show. Thomas McKeon will be here with us. He is a very well-known advocate, a little on the controversial side, mm -hmm. um, uh, who tends to fight very hard for parents, uh, which often that's an interesting combination. He uh, was one of the people that was in the room that chose the puzzle piece, so he talks about why, mm -hmm. and he's gonna be talking about identity. We're also gonna be joined by another one of those artists that's doing a film for the Easter Seals Challenge. Uh, Spencer Hart is gonna be joining mm, us tomorrow. Nice. Spencer's a good friend of mine and I adore her. On Thursday, hold the phone, hold on to everything, get your seatbelts. Dr. Temple Grandin is back with us on Thursday talking about her new book, which is all about employment Amazing. and the importance of employment. So that's gonna be wonderful. And then on Friday, autism expert Jen Barreto is here with us talking about a very serious topic about those severe challenging behaviors Amazing. and self-injurious behavior. So that is the week. Plus we have next week coming up and I can tell you on Monday, we're having Lisa Ackerman from Talk. Great. Uh, they've been doing a month-long conference that you guys should be checking out. So it's, busy, you know. Busy, busy month. Oh, my gosh. And then so many more experts that last uh, week and a half. We'll tell you more about that next week. But that gets you through. And we're going to find a time to reschedule schedule with uh, Lillian Carrier, uh, Autism. But check out the link to her Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge. Remember, every time you watch one of them, it's a vote for that film. You can vote as many times as you like, and the prize is big this year, $15,000 uh, for the Awareness Award. So nice. check it out, you guys. Uh, thank you so much for everything thank you, you do. Thank you, thank you, what a pleasure. And we're so thrilled that we had this time to be with you guys. We'll be back tomorrow. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now. Bye, everyone. Don't forget, you can watch Ask Dr. Doreen live every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Pacific time. We hope to see you there.